first justice dialogue out of the square. But we're not fully out of the square. We're just uh, in walking distance from it. Um, and it's appropriate, I think, that, that Albert Brown is the one giving it. Um, so let me say something about what's coming up. Uh, the next talk on Wednesday will be yours truly, speaking on um, Aristotle's aristocratic uh, distributive justice and the concept of the natural slave. And a week from now, we're going to have Bill Nowak um, talking about clean, which is clean, local, energy, accessible now, which is really a talk about green jobs. Um, so, uh, without further ado, Albert Brown on resource-based economics. Hello, thanks everybody for coming. Um, today's talk is about resource-based uh, economics, a new model moving forward. And um, how many people have seen the movie, uh, any of the movies in the Zeitgeist series? Raise your hand. Okay, so a lot of people. Um, so obviously you're familiar with the term RBE, our resource-based uh, economy. Um, and we're going to be talking about that going a little into detail today on that model. It's an emerging model. Um, it's very different from anything that's ever come before. So it doesn't resemble anything that we have on the planet right now, which makes it exciting for me just because we keep rehashing the same things over and over again. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of like read, read through my talk here. Uh, feel free to stop me if you have questions. I probably won't get through everything I have written down. Uh, but if I do, that'll be amazing. Uh, but I want to leave enough time for discussion also on questions. Um, so I'll just start. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Buckminster Fuller. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, humanitarian, inventor, and visionary thinker, would have saluted this new model for organizing human society. Although we call ourselves civilized, we are still very immature beings who kill one another in mass to obtain land, natural resources, and for political power control over others. In this new model, we'll be able to take full advantage of our best scientific thinking, our most advanced technology, and encourage the fullest potentials and talents of our fellow human beings to help problem solve on a global scale. We would create an abundance of goods and services that meet the needs of all human beings without a, strati a stratified social class system all the while managing our natural resources in a highly intelligent and compassionate manner. Nevertheless, we must first rid ourselves of obsolete constructs such as money, militaries, corporations, national borders, governments, and all other forms of oppressive social controls. This is a new system unlike any other in human history that acknowledges and respects the interdependent nature of every living organism on the planet, and recognizes that we are all connected in multi-level ways. We can now understand that the suffering of one person invariably leads to the suffering of others, and this action-reaction process harms society as a whole. This system is based on the availability of the Earth's natural resources to meet human needs and intelligent human cooperation, not on what you can afford to use to meet your needs for survival. In this new system, you would not be subject to proving, quote unquote, you deserve to have access to all, the, uh, to all that meets your needs. This would be self-evident. This model is known as a resource-based economy, or RBE. Albert Einstein said, we cannot solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. In order to move forward as a human race, we must transcend the status quo, individualistic, and competitive thinking patterns that are prevalent today and instead move into a more rational, scientific, ethical, and visionary mode of understanding our world, ourselves, and the interconnected relationships that we are all, all an integral part of. It is time for humanity to mature and set aside myopic self-interest for the truly honorable and worthy endeavor to co-create the first world civilization. A world, civil, a world civilization that meets all people's basic needs, a civilization that is free from oppression um, and establishes a humanistic system that is based on the greatest human values such as cooperation, justice, compassion, and empowerment via a highly educated and informed decision-making process of direct democracy. 
The Earth needs an upgrade from corptocracy, monarchy, fascism, capitalism, representative republics, parliamentarianism, communism, socialism, and brutal dictatorships. We need an Earth 2.0. We need a resource-based economy. All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, is it accepted as being self-evident. That's a quote by Arthur Schopenheimer. The basic concept of resource-based economy was developed over a lifetime of work by social engineer Jacques Fresco. I'm not going to go into too much about who Jacques Fresco is right now, um, uh, but you know, even as early as the 60s, uh, he was working uh, for free on trying to solve humanity's problems. Um, and, and just specifically a little bit about him, he, his, his main model for that was Buckminster Fuller. So I don't know if any of you were at the Dome for the Buckminster Fuller talk, but uh, Buckminster Fuller was a major, probably the most major influence. Yay! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're here. Hey, how you, how you doing? We're glad to Give me a hug, sir. Give me a hug. Okay. He's the man. <laughs> So Buckminster Fuller is the main influence upon Jock Fresco's work. So although Jock Fresco really developed these ideas uh, in detail, you know, with plans and schematics, it is Buckminster's philosophical ideas and many of his inventions that he's building upon. So. Uh, so Jack Fresco was heavily influenced by the work of Buckminster Fuller, who also worked to free humanity from, com from control by an elite class. The basic idea of a resource-based economy is in the name itself, whereas today's economic systems are based on the management and manipulation of financial instruments, the monetary system, centralized fractional reserve banking, corporate profits, and governmental control of pieces of fiat paper that are created for the benefit of the few at the expense of the many. And a resource-based economy is based on the intelligent management of the Earth's resources with as much efficiency as possible. This new sy system differs from today's economic system and its overall goal. An RBE seeks to meet all people's basic needs, establish a more respectful and healthy relationship between humans and the environment that support our lives, and it seeks to free humanity from all controls of any kind of overclass. Compare that to the goals of a capitalist system that continually accumulates wealth for the use of an elite few by increasing the consumption of the planet's resources in order to ensure that the constructed economy grows forever in complete disregard to the fact that we live on a finite planet with finite resources. In an RBE, there would, be, there would not be any form of money, credit, or debt of any kind. Let me repeat that one more time. <laughs> What's in prison? <laughs> Put, get your mind around that one. In an RBE, there would, be, there would not be any form of money, credit or debt of any kind. Wow. This would create a very powerful shift in priorities and potentials that are not possible right now. We would no longer be held back from true progress by the profit motive, which often stands in the way of logical development and advancement and leads to the destruction of our natural world and to ourselves via war and conflict. Carl Sagan, the celebrated scientist, once said, in our tenure of this planet, we have accumulated dangerous evolutionary baggage, propensities for aggression and ritual, submission to leaders, hostility to outsiders, all of which puts our survival in some doubt. We have also acquired compassion for others, love for our children, a desire to learn from history and experience, and a great, soaring, passionate intelligence the clear tools for our continued survival and propensity. Mm. Nature versus nurture. Human behavior, there is none. There is, or excuse me, human nature. <laughs> there is none, there is no human nature. Um, there is only human behavior. So uh, the social sciences 
have spoke very uh, definitively on this in the last 10 years. For the last 100 years, there's been a big argument in social sciences, nature versus nurture. Which one, uh, you know, has the, the greatest influence upon our lives? Um, the larger role, obviously, is in nurture or in the environment. So, um, you know, we, we're made up of, we have a genotype, we have a phenotype, and we have the environment. And these are the three basic uh, principles that govern our lives. Your genetic, your, your genotype is your genes, what you're made up of, your DNA, right? Your phenotype is what you express. Right. So even though you may have the genes for, for example, say your, your parents and your great-grandparents and your great-great-grandparents were all alcoholics, right? right. That means right. you probably have passed on to you genes for alcoholism. But that does not mean you're going to be an alcoholic. And in fact, the major determinant on whether you will be an alcoholic or will you express those genes is your environment. And this is what the social sciences and the hard sciences have answered in the last, specifically the last five years. They say that the debate is basically over, that nurture by far, or the environment by far, is the larger determinant sure. in your behavior, in your outcomes. That's central to where we're going to go in this discussion. It's central. Okay. Does it mean that you were, and just uh, put it in layman's terms or just common speak? doesn't mean you're going to pick up bad habits from, you know, the person exhibiting, you know, antisocial behavior or an addiction. Because my uh, uncle, he's a stone-cold alcoholic, so is my brother, mm -hmm. and they struggle with it. You know, it's like giving one addiction for another. My, my uncle stopped smoking, but now he mm -hmm. can't stop drinking vodka. That's right. all he does. Right. So just because you have the same genes doesn't mean you're going to have the same behavior. Right. That's the basic idea is what I'm trying to get okay. out right here. Um, I like alcohol. And, and a little talk about the, the environment. So if you would have a simple equation, you could simply say genotype plus environment equals phenotype. In other words, what you're made up of plus the environment you live in equals how you express or how you show up in the world. Okay? It is the expression of genotype. It is the expression, yes. Um, so let's give an example. Let's talk a little bit about violence. So if you lived in, say, a war-torn area, say you were born in Gaza, um, and it's not uncommon to have uh, the Israelis using American military might come over and bomb you on a daily basis, or say you're used to having your family being sniped at by Israeli settlers on a daily basis. Yeah. Like it's, it's usual, it's the usual. People get killed, you don't know if you're going to make it to your 18th birthday. That's the environment you live in. <laughs> right. Yes. So the propensity for you to become a violent person is very high in that environment. So. Uh, when you start looking at these ideas, right, the, there's a very prevalent idea in our society today, and that's, that idea is that we're all greedy, right? It's, it's, just human, it's just human nature, that's what you're gonna hear whenever you start talking about these kind of ideas, it's just human nature. But one of the problems with that argument is that it does not explain altruism. It doesn't explain why somebody will put their own life on the line when it's not in their self-interest to save somebody else. And, and what the scientists say is that we have two basic trends in this regard in human, in human behavior. One is that throughout time, because there's been so much human conflict, we have developed evolutionary um, propensities towards greed, self-interest, and aggression. So those are definitely propensities that because of the environment of our past have been brought to the fore. They're attributes that have been triggered and we express them, right? But at the same time, it does not explain why we would, why I would sacrifice something for myself for my child, or why I would, for a complete stranger, give my life. And there are plenty of examples in in uh, the world that show that that's true. There's examples. There's whole religions like Buddhism and Christianity that are formed around giving to others, being selfless, helping others. There's whole communities organized around ideals like compassion, empathy, love, kindness, cooperation. And if human nature was simply greed and self-interest, those would not exist. They wouldn't be exhibited uh, throughout human history. And not only are they exhibited now, but they've been all throughout human history. So that 
proves that we also have a propensity towards cooperation, mm -hmm. towards empathy, towards love, towards care of others, beyond our self-interest. And that's extremely important moving forward. Albert? Yes. Can I throw a small monkey in there? Sure. So, of course, there's a response in the literature of those people who take the nature position, and you see it in Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene. Mm -hmm. So they're able, they attempt to explain how behavior as really a kind of enlightened self-interest where you engage in altruism because you're actually making a calculation, whether it be one deeply programmed into your, uh, into your you know, behavior by the fact that we're mammals and we do this because it is advantageous, or socialization tells you that you can do certain things that are altruistic but you know it's not in conflict with your selfish nature because in the end it gives benefit in the long run. That still, um, it, it still it, results it, in it, altruistic it, behavior. But it, but it also doesn't. The point answer. is that it it, it, it it saves their view. So if you're trying to make, but an I, argument, I would argue with it. I mean, I've okay. got a, I've got. A, let me hear hear me. So how does how does that explain someone giving their life for a stranger? For example, in war, there's countless examples of somebody literally jumping on a grenade when he simply could just move away or, or, or may already be safe when literally giving their lives for another person. There's countless examples of a soldier running out in fire, grabbing a soldier he doesn't even know who's wounded and pulling him back to safety, putting himself in direct line of death, which is the ultimate self-interest is preservation of life. I want to put this aside. I mean, we can go on and on and on, but I want to talk a little bit more about the resource of basic accounting. But these are good things to think about, so we can continue to think about them. Um, because we need to make money under a monetary system in the sub, sub, uh, subsequent 1% owning class, we have elite interests that fight against utilizing our best science and research in pursuit of helping humanity. Currently, sustainable and renewable energy sources that will not pollute our environment and not are, are not being built or scaled up in development because our economy runs on fossil fuels like oil and natural gas. And these interests are reporting the greatest profits in world history. So the very corporations that uh, are run on fossil fuels have reported their very largest um, of any profits ever recorded the last two years. They've been the largest ever, you know, billions per quarter for things like Exxon and Mobil, their, their profits. Um, Nevertheless, we are facing peak oil production and this outdated energy system will eventually collapse. So what, what I'm basically talking about here is that, is that even when our, in our self-interest, our self-interest, right? We all need energy, the world needs energy. But even when we know better ways to produce energy, cleaner ways that produce energy, energy that would be more abundant, that would not pollute and destroy the very living systems we all need and rely upon, would not create war, right? Even when we have a clear case where one is better than the other, we are stuck in a system and a value system that uses one because it is it is uh, channeled through a class system. So so I'm just kind of putting that example example out. Um, we could instead embrace sustainable energy sources for our physical health and the health of our planet in addition to the vastly higher potential for energy use it gives us. Imagine a world free from money and the profit motive. How would areas of human concern and need be addressed when there is only our best thinking, research, and technology, technology being brought to bear to solve the problems of humanity, free from differential advantage? And I want to just go over a few. I have a, I listed a bunch. And I probably, we probably won't get through all of them, but I'd like to go through a few of them. Um, I want to take on government, uh, energy, food, water, and agriculture. And if we get to it, we might get into things like healthcare, transportation, education, and housing. 
Um, but these are just a few. These are, this is not a compre comprehensive list, but it's a, it's, a, it's a couple of examples where all of us rely on each other. For, these are needs we can't come up with ourselves. We rely on each other somewhat within a system to meet these needs. So I'm going to start with government. These are examples of... These are examples of... I, I, I preface that with if we were living in a world that was free of the profit motive, free of a monetary system, and we we're moving towards a resource-based economy, how would these areas of human concern be different from the way they are now? Okay? So I want to be clear about that. So we're going to start with government. First of all, in a resource-based economy, you would not have a government as you understand it now. There would be no national government. In fact, there would be no national boundaries or borders. There wouldn't be Canada and the United States. There wouldn't be um, a, a parliamentary system in the UK and a republic in the United States. Why not? Because in a resource-based economy, it, would only, it could only function if you had a global systems approach to the world. Meaning that you would the basic government would be a system of monitoring all the world's natural resources in a comprehensive way through a comprehensive public database that everyone would have access to. This comprehensive database would be highly technological um, and would keep, have up to the minute um, updates of all the world's natural resources. And the way you would make decisions, uh, and this is, there's some argument about this, about the part of how you make decisions. There's some people that, that believe in an RBE, you should have uh, a decision-making process that's scientific, that uh, is somehow computer-generated through the best ideas that have been fed into it already. There's some people who think you should have a direct democratic process where everyone votes uh, on, that, on the uh, decisions that are made. I tend to fall on that side, on the direct democratic process. But basically, your form of government would be a world monitoring system of natural resources and a distribution of those resources to meet human needs. So things like a government would actually be, get in the way of, of that happening. As long as we have governments, you will have governments that are biased towards corporate interests, individual interests. You will have uh, this bias towards making sure some, some have more than others. And as long as we have a class stratified society, we can't have a system of distribution that meets people's basic needs. You can't have it. There are always gonna be haves and have nots in a class stratified society. That's the word, it means it itself. The term stratified means that there, there is a level, some are down here and some are up here. Some have more, some have less. So that has to go in order to bring this new model. <coughs> So first, and the first process of that, right, in, in, uh, in Occupy Buffalo, our moniker for a long time, for the last four months, has been inform, reform, transform. So this talk is really the first stage, it's the inform stage, it's just trying to understand and wrapping your mind around what an RBE would be like. What, you have in that, what kind of resources are you referring to? All. Well, I mean, because uh, some resources involve a lot of pollution, mm -hmm. So, so maybe, maybe, did you just come in, Valerie? Yeah. Okay, so we talked a little bit already about energy, but I'm going to get into it in more detail, so if you hang on, you'll hear some of that. But when they, they mine gold, mm -hmm. poisons. Sure. Everybody's Yeah, of course. I mean, we're talking about all the Earth's resources, and we'd have to find ways. But, but one of the problems, Valerie, that we have now is that the way we do things is done based on profit. Right. So if you took the profit motive away and instead you gave the problem to thinkers, you gave the problem to the people, how can we best do this? For example, a car. Say, I don't think we'd even, I don't know if we'd even use cars in a resource-based economy. We may use some other form of transportation. But let's say for the sake of argument that we use cars, right? You probably wouldn't have cars that are built to last five years. You would have cars that maybe be built to last a thousand years because we have the science to do that. Of course, we don't do that, and that would be the most efficient way to do something is that my children's children's children could still be using 
these cars, right, that we could build today. We could be using some of these resources to build things that last, but we don't do that. Planned obsolescence is part of the capitalist system. Scarcity is built into the system. C cyclical consumption is built into the system. That's how you form profit for a stratified class society. You make somebody have a lot, mo a lot more than everybody else because you, you use the Earth's resources up quickly and make people have to come back for more. So that's part of the system we're trying to get out of. So it's hard to think, it's hard to wrap our minds around this because really it doesn't look like anything that's come before. So it is difficult. You gotta bear with me though. So do resources include us? Yes, our human resources, and absolutely. Okay. Our talents, our potentials, right, right. our education, right. all of it is included in this. And in fact, the very first step of an RBE would be to make a world inventory of all resources on the planet something that we don't even have now none of us have access to that information so that would be the before you write before you do something the first thing you want to know is what do you have to work with right and we don't even know that that information is is not publicly available it's used against us every day so the thing we have to that is futures markets what'd you say the closest thing we have to that is futures markets right like or, or, so right. Right. or Local, local, uh, some of the local economy, uh, local uh, monetary systems, mm -hmm. or you know, like the <coughs> Ithaca dollars or you know, right. Carborough dollars. Yeah, there's whatever. some knowns. Right. We do, so you know, we can be, find some things that out. Would be right? exam is that like it's sort of like globalizing that kind of a system? Yeah, including other resources, hard resources. Everything would be resources. every. So think about this for a second. Every resource on the planet, below the ground, in the water in the air, every human being, every type of resource imaginable. Imagine that all in a central database that Bhakti had access to, that a 70 year old had access to, that was not, that was completely open source. We're talking about an open source society. Hmm. I can't even imagine that. I can't even start to imagine that. Yeah, it's hard, it it's like hard to think about. It, it, but it isn't, right? Because this is what we're talking about is things that we have, we have the technology to do this now, today. This is not something that is Star trek -y. This isn't about going to other, you know, star systems and, and having some kind of advanced propulsion well, that what, doesn't what exist. I mean by it right. sounds like Star Trek because in Star Trek, that's what they have. Right. He's like, oh, we gave up money years ago. I'm like, right. can you give us that episode, please? <laughs> right. <laughs> imagine, imagine if our society was based around cooperation for the highest good, not upon the private accumulation of wealth for an elite few. And those are two different ways of thinking, right? So let's, so let's start with this. And, and again, this is a systems approach. This is a systems approach to the entire planet that is based on scientific, scientific thought. This is not just some philosophy. Um, this is why it's so exciting to me personally. So I want to start with government. So again, there would be no central government like you know of. There would be no England and United States, no Canada. There would be a world which you are a world citizen and you belong to that. That sounds like the Masons. <laughs> no, this is nothing like the Masons. <laughs> Please don't, don't associate this with that. What are, what are the Masons? Well, I mean, like Quakers? People can be confused. No, 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 nothing. No, they're not the Quakers. No, this is I heard of it. And in fact, if you, if, you look at the, if you look at the principles and philosophy behind this thinking, it's more anarchist than any other form that you could kind of, rel uh, uh, you could kind of uh, relate right now to anything that exists. Because if you look at true anarchism and true anarchist ideals, it is exactly that. It's about mutual aid. It's not about dependency upon some centralized hierarchy of any kind, whether it's communist, socialist, capitalist. Government is one example. Fascist. Government is one example. Yes, okay. And I didn't really get through all of that, but uh, we'll, go, we'll go into energy. Um, so energy is, a, we talked a little bit about it earlier. So right now, we're a fossil fuel. The whole world runs on fossil fuels, oil and gas. That's the game, that's the ticket. So in, uh, even though our science has answered this question over and over again, especially in the last five years, there's already been inventories on, on the uh, four major forms of renewable energy. Geothermal, wind, solar, and then water, which would include hydro, tidal, and wave energy, okay? So these four major forms of energy, any one of them could produce all the world's energy needs many times over. All of them together would produce it in abundance. For example, I'll give you one, I'll give you one statistic from MIT. Uh, 
the amount of sunlight that hits the earth every 24 hours is 1,000 times the amount of energy that the entire earth uses per day. Just solar. Geothermal, uh, right now we have the capacity for six terawatts of geothermal energy on the earth. The earth uses less than one terawatt per year for the whole earth. Me, what does that mean we have the capacity? Meaning that if we were to use uh, the already available technology that we have right now without any further research or development, just what we have now, but we actually scaled it up to what our potential. We have the ability to build things, make things, we have this potential, but we're not doing it. We're not doing it. And why don't we do it? Because of money, interest, and the profit motive. So there's a reason why we're not utilizing what we already have, right? And um, Michio Kaku, a very well-known scientist mm. who's on Fox News a lot, speaks a lot on the, on, the, on, on, the, uh, on the air a lot. He's the one who formed the idea of a, of a world civilization. And he said, before you become a first-class world civilization, you would first need to new learn how to harness the energy of your nearest star. We haven't even done that yet. So we're not a world civilization yet. We're still kind of tribalistic, ethnocentric, we're still fighting each other, beating each other over the head with these clubs, trying to take things from each other instead of cooperating. So energy is a perfect example. We could literally produce thousands of times of what we need in energy without burning a single ounce of fossil fuel, which pollutes and destroys our environment and creates war and profit for a few. We could do this today with on-the-shelf technology. On-the-shelf technology. I just want to say one thing. Michio Kaku came to Buffalo and debated a guy from GE and Interesting. against installing nuclear power here. Beautiful. Really, he was really important in that. Well, that was good. When did he come here? He's a professor at He's already came, I think. He's oh. a professor at City University of New York. Right. Did somebody else have a question? You think our. Uh, I'm uh, sorry, my thoughts. Uh, you think our, our so-called dependence on foreign oil and gas uh, eliminates the ability to uh, really invest in wind and solar no, and no. other power? Not, not to uh, you know, you know, repeat what Obama's been talking about forever. No, I, I believe that's, that's a lie. really. I don't really. believe what we're li relying at all. I believe what we're relying on is not Middle East oil. What we're relying on is oil companies and corporations. Oh, like and BP you're, and, and you're forced Shell. to be relying on it because right. they're they're not offering any uh, alternatives, even though we have the alternatives. So you're what what's right. the real reliance is on a system that produces corporations that force you to use products right. that you have no other. You have no other avenue to use anything else, right? And so then, they, then, they, then the secondary concerns are: well, it's Middle East oil, and we have to fight. Here's why the wars, and here's why you right. should support them. All and that shut up. Uh, propaganda, right? Nonsense. And that's why we're going to go into Iran and everything else, right? Yeah. So we're going to weapons and mass destruction or uh, uranium to build us. So I, I want to keep moving oh, here. Oh, sure, so, sure, sorry. Uh, geothermal by far is probably the easiest for us to use, even though uh, all of these are, are, are accessible right now. Solar, we could produce a lot of energy from it. Wind, a lot. And the, and the tidal and wave, just enormous amounts of energy. But what's, what's, what could do the world over and over and over again is the geothermal because it's in the ground, it's beneath our feet. The earth is always producing heat, and it's very easy to just pull heat out of the ground. It's not hard to do so. You simply run, run uh, lines through the ground, not very deep either. And also there's places such as um, uh, hot springs, there's places where uh, volcanic activity, Iceland's a perfect example of that. Iceland, part of, I don't know the percentage, I read it, but it's not in my head and I didn't write it down. But a certain percentage, a large percentage of their electricity comes from just the fact that they sit on a very volcanic area. Wow. And so they use a lot of that hot boiling water, they use it to, to fuel it. Yeah. Uh, electric uh, producing sense. power plants. So yes, it's very, it's wonderful. And we have that here, we don't use any of that. We, we don't use any of it. Right now we're completely 100% reliant on fossil fuels, even though we know that we're at peak oil right now. We know that oil and gas is going to collapse. There's no doubt about it. It is going to happen. We're already at least halfway through, and we're using it faster now than ever. So it's not going to take another 40 years to figure that one out. Um, 
So there's a certain amount of um, irrationality in the way that we run our human society is the basis for what I'm, I'm arriving at is that the way we do things does not make sense. We're not, we're not approaching this from a problem solving perspective. We're not saying, here's the problem, what are our assets, what are the needs, how do we use our assets to fulfill our needs and how do we do that in a healthy and sustainable way for future generations of our children's children's children. That's not what we do. See, that's just too common sense. All right. Yeah. What we do is Doesn't say, here's a bunch of rich people, Doesn't let's keep supporting them at the cost of our own lives and our environment problem. because that's what we've always profit. done. Yeah. We don't want that's to use insanity. anything alternative because it's um, not profitable to those companies. Is that basically a common sense answer? It's not profitable to those companies. That's why we don't do alternative the energy sources. Would think about their children's children. And they, they do. For themselves, they organize. In fact, they organize for themselves, kind of like their own but little they bubbles. The air and everything that but then they would buy filters for the air. I mean, it it gets that crazy. It does. It does get that crazy. So let's talk about institutionalized power. Like they don't care because they have the ability to institutionalize the power. So no matter what the situation is, as long as money exists and they have more of it, that they will survive forever because they have advantages that we don't. Right. As long as there's no infrastructure to support resource-based economies. They will survive forever, and you won't. And that leads you to work for them a whole lot harder because you're literally working for your, your life, your children's life. That's right. And in fact, you know, I, I bring this, I bring this up a lot because I do a lot of research on news that a lot of people don't follow. Like I follow a lot of the hedge fund managers who, who, who fund, who have funds in their portfolios of like forty to a hundred to two hundred billion dollars, very large funds.